Hello, everybody, and welcome to There's a Will in this fine winter's day when we have snow on the ground in beautiful downtown Warsaw, and uh, it's chilly, but uh, Christmassy, wouldn't you say? My guest in studio is Philip Goss. Hello, yes. You may remember from previous shows, uh, he is uh, uh, chairman of several boards and also an entrepreneur in his own right, and a man who's done his own share of aid work uh, during uh, the time that the war has been going on since, uh, since the end of February. In fact, uh, very active in this area. Uh, and uh, your latest project is extremely interesting, dealing with uh, trying to solve, find homes and resolution for orphans from Ukraine who are uh, somewhat marooned here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and on the horn, we have our expert sinologist who does wonders for everyone's sinuses, Ogird Ujimbo. Hello. I've been practicing saying your name. I mean, the last time I made a big mistake with your name, but a lot of people told me they thought that was funny. Um, because they thought I did it on purpose, and I would never make a mistake with such an easy name as yours to pronounce, Professor. Next time, next time you do that, I'll remind you a story of my grandfather in a German lager. Why don't you tell me now? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you, because people usually get offended when they get compared to some, some part of that story. Okay, I don't want to be—it's probably involving Nazis or something. Yes. I don't think I'll I don't want to be compared to a Nazi today. If I if I wanted to be compared to a Nazi, I think I'd be a Jewish prime minister of uh, or president of of an uh, of Ukraine. That's the surest way to get compared to a Nazi by by, the way, by certain happy people new year called to Russians. Both of you. What? Happy, happy new, new year. Happy both new both year. It's good to see you. And uh, yeah, it's good. We have actually we have the Christmas weather now. Do you have snow in Because uh, we have a Chinese New Year now. We have Chinese New Year. What is it the year of now? We're, rabbit? we're coming into the year of... Is it rabbit. The, it's the rabbit. I knew that. Unless you're a Vietnamese, then it's a cat. Uh, because the Vietnamese and the Chinese can never agree on anything. Well, Except, they agree on the other 11 signs, but the cat is not a rabbit. The cat is not a rabbit. Still, to this day, the cat is not a rabbit. But uh, I want, uh, cats like to chase rabbits, don't they? I'm not sure. Yes, they can. Well, can the they? funny thing is, in Polish uh, uh, hunting language, cat is the name of a male rabbit. Mm -hmm. Ah, I did not know that. And then what word would that be? Cot, simply. Oh, you mean, uh, so the, just the normal word cot is also a yeah. large rabbit. But not but kotzur? No, no, Kotsur also. It's another one, but hmm. usually the, the, the one for the rabbits. Hairs, hmm. actually, not rabbits, but hairs. Hmm. Well, I, I, I was on an interesting trip this week. I went to, to Konin. Have you ever been to Konin there? So I, I've been close to Konin. Yeah, I've close to, to I, Konin. I in Ko as a translator. It sounds like a, that sounds like a country song, close to Konin. <laughs> you'll be driving in your truck. Um, yeah, so you've been close to Konin. A lot of people say that because the motorway is nearby. But uh, not a lot of people, not a lot of people stop off, right? And there's one very you've interesting never been place to there, and I see yeah. you've I, been I there. I have been. Wait, I think I've been through there. I think I went there once, but I may be mistaken. Well, you used to have town. to go through before the motorway, but... Uh, you know what, Will? Built. Yeah. I've seen you've been there because there's one interesting thing that the, my Chinese engineers, I was a translator in Kowo, and I was resident there for like two months, and we visited a place that was surprisingly interesting for them, which is completely undeveloped in terms of international tourism, Lichen. Yes, Lichen I've been to, you saw the picture yeah, I, yeah. I, on Facebook, which is the, why don't you tell us what Lichen is? Uh, well, it's a giant cathedral with yeah. very interesting national elements to it. Yeah. If you pay attention, we, we have uh, David's star and Polish hussars on the seats, 
and a very interesting national labyrinth in the when you enter the place. I don't know whether you have seen it. No, I didn't. I didn't get a chance to go in, in, inside because we were doing a road trip, and so just stopping at various places on our way to the to the far west of Poland, which is a place I haven't been to a lot of times. So we're starting to really explore that for the travel show, Poland Daily Travel. And uh, I, have, I have a new cameraman. You know, I had a cameraman named Volva from Kiev. And you may remember he moved to Vancouver. Great, yeah. cam great cameraman, great, great friend. Um, I now have a totally different person who is named Vova and is from Kiev. <laughs> <laughs> That's confusing. It's two Vovas. Makes and I life used, easy, though. <laughs> yeah, it makes life easy. I, Phil, I used to have both cameramen were called, were called Vova, and they, we used to work together, so I had to call one Vova 1 and Vova 2. Now, Vova 1 went off to do other things for a while, and Vova 2 stayed with me, and then eventually we just started filming alone with one cameraman because it's... Ah, well, I won't go into the... It's just easier to work with two people than, well, with, do you realize that than with three or four Vova. with a sound man. What? There's another Vova from Kiev that you surely know of. Um, well, there's Vova Zelensky. Vo Vodomir. Yeah, Vova is short for Vodomir. Vodomir, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the yeah, president. So every president. Vodomir is actually Vova. The present, my the line producer in there... A uh, lovely fellow. It just screamed in my ear. So I'll be going to a ear doctor following the, following the, <laughs> screamed in my ear. Zielinski! Because I'm too stupid to pig figure it out. <laughs> Obviously. So, yeah, so we went. But I'll tell you, in, the thing about Conan, which is interesting, is they have a Roman road marker that is the only existing Roman road marker from, you know, 15, 1600 years ago. North of the mountains? Yeah. I didn't think the Romans came. It's the only one because of the amber route. Ah. The amber route went through Conan. There was a ford across the river there. Okay. Now, the old town of Conan is uh, fairly presentable. You can see a couple of interesting things. A synagogue, which has been... Uh, a uh, synagogue which has been, uh, is being reno renovated. Reminds me a bit of the one in Tkachin, which is really, really nice. Tkachin is yes. on the way to Białystok, for people who don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's near Zembrów, where, uh, where the prof good professor is today. Uh, I call him Ogierd Ujimbo. Well, you might do that, but do others. That's what I call him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, and they have a beautiful synagogue there, completely renovated. I think it's the best one in Poland that I've seen. Uh, it might be a secret one I haven't seen, but it's great. And uh, attention to detail is magnificent, even better than Krakow, I think. I've been to the one in Tukocin. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you yes. agree with me that it's amazing? It, that's a, it is amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm looking forward to, after the end of the war, a friend of mine has been trying to renovate the largest synagogue in Europe left standing and not destroyed. Um, uh, after oh, it's World just War over II, the border, isn't it? It is at yeah. Zhukiev in yeah. Ukraine, which is on the way to Lviv. Yeah. And uh, I've been around it on the outside. Were you with me one of those times? Yes. Okay, so yeah. I was. Remember. We did that. We drove uh, all around looking for it. Yeah, and we found it eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a lot of what a lot of people don't know is there is, uh, apart from the Poland Museum and the great uh, synagogue in Krakow with all the surroundings there, hotels, and, and uh, there's actually a newer synagogue there now, I believe, and, um, and uh, you, know, you can uh, get, a, get a slight taste, because it was such a developed community, you get a slight taste what the Jewish community was like in Poland at that time, um, before World War II. And uh, at any rate, so there is the Roman marker there, which is right next to a very beautiful church, which starts in Romanesque and goes all the way through Rococo style. Romanesque architecture? Yeah. It's Romanesque foundation. Really? That's This quite was old. an old place because it was a, it was a, fa it was a uh, Romanesque, not Roma, but Romanesque. Right, right, right. I understand. Yeah. I understand. That's pre-Gothic. Just the, yeah, yeah, pre-Gothic. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. The oldest stuff in Poland is, is pre-Gothic, yeah. yeah. And this was there uh, as a smaller chapel sort of thing. But uh, remember, there were people going through on the Amber Route. This was a major place. There is a church that was, I think it's the only Templar establishment in what is today Poland. It's over towards, the, it's, uh, it's near, um, the, near the border, near the German border, up off the river. It's, uh, um, what's the name of the city uh, that I'm thinking of? That was, the old town was destroyed on the island and it's left as it was, and then they built it. Koobzik, is it? No, not Koobzik. Where exactly is it's it? It's on the river, um, further south by the bird sanctuary. I don't know what the bird sanctuary is. You mean on the on the Odra? On the Odra, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Ko I was nad Odrą. That's it. It's just north of Kostyn nad Odrą. Oh, Kostyn, I've heard of. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's worth going to. You no, I, like I want to go there. I want to do a whole trip along the Odra. I got fascinated by the Odra. You know why? Because we also we drove from Konin. It was a beautiful day, and the, weather, the few beautiful days that we've had in the last three months. This was one of them, and just great sunlight. So that was the reason we went, and planned to go on that day. And we were, managed to drive uh, Olgerd all the way to uh, Zielona Gura and uh, just stayed there the night. Then the next day went to Nova Sol. Do you know what that is? The old salt refining place from back 500 years ago. Um, and was, uh, and is still a working port. Now, I didn't know that there were small working ports on the Oder, or the Odra, as Poles say, the Oder River, we would say in English. I, I didn't realize that there were uh, so many, uh, uh, or that there were any uh, uh, working ports, and this was definitely one of them, but not the only one, I'm told. Well, the difference, if we look at the Oder versus the Vistula River, yeah. is that the Oder is a managed river, yes. insofar as its banks and things are concerned, and flood control. Whereas the Vistula, it's being, that being the western, I'm sorry, the easternmost managed river in Europe, the Vistula being the westernmost unmanaged river. Right. There, there are some uh, dams and things along the Vistula, but for the most part, the uh, riverbanks are unmanaged, other than in certain places in the cities. But um, the Germans had developed an intracoastal waterway to go from Kaliningrad all the way to Berlin without going out to the Baltic, and that went through Bidgosch. There's a canal. Bidgosch Canal, that's yeah, right. The canal yeah. that connects the two yeah. watersheds. I've been there, and, and I remember we were talking a bit about that uh, in, in one of the travel programs. Uh, I like Bidgosch, by the way. Um, interesting uh, small town. Much renovated and, and a lot to recommend these days. So Novosol, which is the old salt place, and then Zagan. Does Zagan mean anything to you, Olgierd? If you pronounce it Zagan, perhaps yes. Oh, uh, Zagan, okay. Yeah, but no person looking at that is going to say, uh, it's, you know how Polish names are, English names too for Americans, or most people. They're not going to look, they're going to look at that and go, well, it must be Zagan, right? But we know it yeah, has a, right. it so has an see. accent over it, so it's Zagan, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and what happened in Zagan? Mm -hmm. Anybody know the answer? I don't. The Great Escape. You know ah, the movie? Yes. There was the, and oh, they yeah. did the tunnel, and the, the, yeah. they found, they did the archaeological dig there a number of years ago at this point. Yeah. They found the remains of the old tunnel and things, mm. yes. Mm. It's fascinating stuff. We didn't go there because we didn't have enough time. The light was running out. We did uh, the monastery in town. And did you know that Johannes Kepler was from Zagan? I did not. And so was uh, uh, Wojtek the Bear. <laughs> What was the German name of Zagan before the war? Uh, uh, wait a second. Zielona Gura was uh, Grunberg, mm -hmm. and I remember that. Neusaltz was the name of uh, Nova Salz. Zagan, Nova that's Sol. what they say. What was Zagan? What did the Ger They said Zagan, the Germans? Zagan in Schlesien. In Silesian, right? Yep. I want, was that the same as what the Germans would say? Apparently, yes. Apparently, yes. Okay. Another interesting thing I found out. We're going to talk about China. I have a lot of information. We're going to talk about China. But I thought it'd be nice to, yeah. to just chat about some of the interesting things I've been seeing. 
and, and throw those out. I was for just discussion. looking on my maps here yeah. for the name of the town with the temple, the only Templar establishment in today, what is Poland, Sarbinovo is the name of the place, I think, or is it Kwaszczane? I can't remember, it's one of the two, yes. I forget which. In one of those places, they, the, they use Knight Templar's labor to build a church. They were prisoners. Uh, and, that and they, may yeah, be the same they place. Use them, yeah. This area was part of Poland. That's what I wanted to say, too. This extreme, there are two things. I, I, Olga, you know that this was part of Poland what was founded a thousand years ago. This area, well, a little over a thousand years ago. That this, this area was Polish. And then it went yeah. to the Germans. I think we talked about that, perhaps. But it went to the Germans for a long time. Hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and of course, this whole part of Western Poland, was it, was it in Poland uh, during the interwar years between World War I and World War II? Part of it, yes. Uh, w w not the extreme West, right? This was in yeah. Germany, right? I don't, which part was still in Poland? In the interwar well, years. Well, the ones we mentioned first, they were still in Poland. Or well, Conan, of including Bydgoszcz. Yeah. Yes, because those places Bydgoszcz were. Yeah. Was a starting point for the war, actually. One of them. Uh, for the Second War. Second World War. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if we look at not the political establishment and borders and lines, but but where the church drew its lines, we see that Gniezno remains to this day the. Uh, ecclesiastical capital of Poland. Right, Gniezno, just a little bit uh, north, north east. and east of Poznan. Yeah, of Poznan, yeah. yeah. Of Poznan. Which has yeah. a fascinating church, yes. Yeah, it, the, the church is great. The, the town's interesting, actually, mm -hmm. too. Um, it's up on a little hill, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's quite interesting, for sure. You could easily spend a nice uh, day there looking about, have some lunch. And, and nearby is Venezia, the narrow gauge train museum. Yeah, narrow gauge is your thing. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of that. Narrow gauge uh, trains in Poland, there's a lot of them. What does it mean, though? Um, in Polish, it's called wąskotorowy. Mm -hmm. And narrow gauge was used for lighter applications uh, or for places where the ground wouldn't support the heavier types of trains. For example, um, there was narrow gauge that went all throughout the uh, Vistula Delta, so areas along Malbork, the Chef, and between, an entire narrow gauge na rail network connecting the little villages there, which was operational through the late 90s. Parts of which from Nowy Dwór Gdański are still operational today up to, um, uh, up to the coast. Well, there's even one uh, closer than that on the edge of the Campinas uh, Forest. Oh, yes, there are many around Poland. Yeah, yes. and, but there are a lot of them. You run across them, and uh, I've never been on one, but they never seem to be operating when I'm around. Sohachev has narrow gauge, and they have a yeah. narrow gauge steam engine which takes excursions on Saturdays. I got a question for, for Olgird. Olgird, because you got, you got to be rested up because I'm going to throw a lot of Chinese stuff at you in the second half of the program. Um, the uh, which I hope you're prepared for, being a sinologist. And also, could I make an appointment to have my sinuses looked at? Since you're a... No? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're not that kind of sinologist. Okay. Um, yes, I can, I can look up uh, your sinuses. I have to open them from outside to see clearly. Oh, yeah, that sounds a little rough. Now, um, <clears throat> maybe I'll... Uh, yeah. Anyway, this, this is a question for you. When I was over there, we we're going about these little towns, of which there's so many uh, in this area, that are fascinating um, and revealing the Polish and the, and the Bohemian and the, and the German, Germanic cultures. Um, I had a feeling. Why is it always that we're looking at Poland and thinking the Germans were in Poland somewhere, the edge or deeper in? Uh, Whereas we know on the other side, it went back and forth quite a lot. I said, I have a feeling that Dresden was once part of Poland. I just have this feeling. I'm going to look it up. And boy, oh boy, did I find out that there was a king, Augustus, at the end of uh, the uh, 1600s, who was in fact brought in as a German. And in fact, Dresden was part of his holdings. So, and he had the kingdom of Poland. And I believe Lithuania as well. 
and uh, what was still you know remaining of that uh, the Duchy of Lithuania, whatever it was called at that time. And uh, uh, so Poland, in fact, did include Dresden at one time. How about well, that? Well, not exactly technically Poland, but we were in one country. But you, right, oh, you were in one country. Dresden yeah. and even Berlin are cities with Slavic uh, origins. Yeah. The name Berlin is, is, is not German originally, yeah. supposedly. Dresden, no. it, there is still a Slavic speaking community dying out. But Sorbians are still living there, and if you, if you go there, you'll see that there are double names on, on road signs. Is that and right? Part of them are written not in Polish, but even in, in, in exactly in Sorbian, in the local uh, local Wuzhichan, as we say in Polish yeah. language. I did like not in know Kashubi, that. where they have things in Kashubian and in Polish. Well, this I knew, yeah. but I just wasn't aware because you're always hearing, oh, you know, there's, the Germans had more influence on Poland. But there's a lot of. Anytime you have these borders, they go. They're, well, the, they're, well, Sudet has its own, Schlonsk, right? Has its own language, which is a, a, a border language transitional uh, using Silesian. elements of yeah. just German yeah. and, uh, and, and, and uh, Polish. Which yeah. if and I speak both German and Polish, and so I can understand it, but I could never make make it. I can simply understand, recognize. Yeah, I see how this word. I see, understand the meaning of a word that. Yeah, well, you know a lot more about these kind of things than I do, and uh, that's a that's a very interesting point. That there was a Silesian language, that there is a Kashubian. It still is. I mean, yeah, there's still. Uh, yeah, sure. There was a Missourian <laughs> language. There's still Latin too. Not a lot of people the, use it. The Missourian. Do they still no, use? Silesian is still used. I have some students that still use it. Although, one of the unfortunate things that we do not recognize it as a country, as a uh, separate language. You you Which don't recognize you as a separate language. You don't recognize it. Kashubian is a separate language. It is. Yeah. And Kashuba is, of course. Well, tell us where it is, Phil. Well, it's. Um, Technically, the Hell Peninsula is part of Kashubia, as is Gdynia. Now, Kashubia has two parts, Kashubia Bletne and yeah. Kashubia uh, Vodne, I yeah. want to say, meaning water Kashubia, the coastal areas, mm -hmm. Hell Peninsula, Gdynia, and so forth, and Bletne meaning more but not mud Gdansk. or dirt. But not Gdynia. No, not Gdynia, not Sopot. Right, right. just, just um, Gdynia. Okay. Just Gdynia, and maybe not even all of Gdynia. Okay. Uh, but then inland from there, uh, basically west and south, uh, Tchef is not Kashubi. It's west of Tchef. And if we go further south to Pelplin, that is also not Kashubi. That's Kochevye, which is... Pelplin. 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 P-E-L-P-L-I-N, which was the ecclesiastical capital of what is today northern Poland back in the 17th, 18th centuries, I want to say. Pelplin is a, an interesting monastery where they actually have a Gutenberg Bible. That is well worth... The trip, and you can go to Malbork while you're there. Okay, we got to end this first segment. Thanks, guys. Thank you, uh, thank you, Olgird. When we come back, we're actually going to talk about uh, China and uh, put some uh, try to f try to make some sense out of what's going on with China now and uh, in the uh, nearer long term. Can I say that nearer long term? I think medium so. term. Yeah, the medium term. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you after the break. Watch these ads with rapt attention. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to There's Will. The second half of the program, we have with us in the studio Philip Goss, and we have Professor Olgerd Ujiembo. Ujiembo, Ujiembo, Ujiembo. On the horn from Zambrov in uh, beautiful, on the edge of beautiful Mazowiecki and um, Podlasia counties, uh, or provinces, I suppose, I should say. Yeah. Provinces, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and we want to talk about China because that is what Olgerd does. Olgerd is wise in many things, but uh, China is your speciality. He is a professor or a lecturer, I should say, a PhD man at uh, the Warsaw University who speaks fluent Chinese and writes fluent Chinese. So his man that I'm very much impressed by because I can hardly write English. Chinese, you mean Mandarin? 
I mean Mandarin, I guess. Do I mean Mandarin? All good? Mostly, yes. Yes, mostly Mandarin. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about some of the things that have been going on in China and then look forward over the next 10 to 25 years because why? Because the demographics suggest, in some interpretations, that their statistics have been falsified and that they are, after 40 years of a single child policy, they're coming to realize that they've shot themselves in the foot and they don't have enough people of productive age to continue their population or to supply uh, labor and goods and support for an elderly population. Yes, very, very true. Uh, Olgird, what was the thinking behind the one-child policy? Let's start with that. Um, because well, the that's... thinking was that China is going to explode like a population bomb, so we have to curb down the population growth because there'll be just way too many people and they'll waste too much resources and China will not be able to feed itself with the old style farming. So it was interesting because it was almost during the same generation that first Mao Zedong suggested that China has to multiply as fast as it's possible in order to have the to free the peoples of the world. And then there, were, there comes the more, uh, so to say, down to earth, very pragmatic uh, leadership of Deng Xiaoping which in turn decides to curb down the growth of the population with a one-child policy, which never was a, and that's something that we usually overlook, it was never general in China, it was always implemented on a local level. So there are many different localities, there are many very different rules as to the one-child policy. And they did not apply, apply even, even to the Chinese Han minority, I'm not even talking about uh, minority, but minority, minority uh, majority of Chinese. Uh, some of them in like around Shanghai were allowed more children. Some of them were not allowed even one child. And even to have the first child, you had to apply to a local population control bureau. That's why usually uh, foreigners, when they try, try to calculate the actual demographics, because everybody always was sure that Chinese do something with the numbers. But usually what we were thinking, I'm not a demographer, I've researched languages, but in uh, general sinology circles was this kind of thought that we are underestimating the number of children because a lot of girl births go unreported, unregistered. Therefore, the numbers for population are actually, in actuality, higher than they are uh, in the, on the paper. Whereas the recent studies show, or at least suggest, that the enrollment in schools, for example, is lower than it should be by the numbers that are suggested by Chinese government. But then again, uh, there is the whole system, and I don't think it was mentioned in that study, there is the whole system of local schools, which are in a way outside of the governmental school system because of the a lot of misplaced persons, the people that are working, they brought with them their, their children and they are not allowed free schooling because they are not registered in the, lo in the local government because HUCO or the registration goes uh, with the birth of the mother. So it's not easily movable from one part of China to another. And those people usually use Gray, uh, gray zone kind of, not really properly reported. Minjian Xuxiao, so the local schools, which are not necessarily in those statistics. So I wouldn't jump to the conclusions that a lot of journalists did. I'm still not sure about the numbers. Yes, it, it's a curious policy because it was adopted to, uh, because they were worried about uh, starvation basically, if the population continued, which you said. Um, and uh, also, it led to, well, if you want to curtail the population, have a lot of male children uh, and don't have female children, because females, of course, bear the children, at least mostly, with the odd man, apparently, who's allowed to bear children now, but not enough to sustain a society. Um, that's a joke. Um, 
the uh, uh, the thing is that w there's this story. I don't know if it's a myth or not that that uh, women, children, sorry, female children were were killed at uh, at birth, or there were abortions if they knew it was going to be a, uh, a a female child. I mean, you have to be in the city to know that and have scans and things that they wouldn't know in the countryside. So the question is, what is that true? And uh, how did they control this in the countryside? You said they had local, th you know, local governments were in charge. But in the vast countryside away from the big cities, which is most of, you know, the huge part of China uh, in terms of geography, how did, uh, how did this work out there? There is, the, there is a big problem. And with that study, uh, what, what I have read, yes, the general data that is provided by different levels of Chinese government is not integrated properly enough, so we see that there are loopholes. Uh, as you say, local government. Local government can control pretty well what is going on locally, but there was a, a, such a phenomenon called fleeing mothers. So the mothers would flee to a big city in order to melt in with the crowd, and they would give birth illegally there, in the giant, not slums, because China didn't have quite slums like India or Brazil, but outside of the local government control in the city. And those children will go unregistered. And I know there is a phenomenon, because you can glean that data from different TV shows and, and other sources, that there is a phenomenon that was existent at least, at least five years ago, was still in existence that were people that had unregistered for their entire life, they were using fake ID for their entire life, and it was possible to gain most of their services by using a Xerox copy of, a, of an ID. As you can imagine, that is not difficult to fake. Pretty easy to fake, I would think. Yes? One thing Phil? I find fascinating is this. Yeah. The rationale behind implementing the one-child policy was that there was a fear of inadequate food production for the population, given old traditional farming techniques, which were labor intensive. If we look at the history of mechanization of agriculture, whether in the United States or elsewhere in the world or China, uh, we find that the labor input per or the caloric value per hour of labor input increases. We have more pr uh, efficiency in production, more productivity with less labor. How, and, and, and here's a question to Olgierd, how has Chinese agriculture changed, if at all, to modernize, to increase productivity and move away from non-mechanized farming and into industrialized agriculture, and, and therefore allowing for less labor and maybe even for a downsizing of the population, meaning uh, that the population itself isn't necessary for that labor for the agricultural output, but rather we use machines instead? It didn't change that much. Until now, the, the, still the report, the official number is like around 50% people live in the countryside. Uh, unofficially, probably it's less than 40, but we do not know. Uh, secondly, they do have labor-intensive techniques, at least in the south of China. And in the north of China, the, the mechanization is still underway. And of course, Chinese, there is a problem with labor in China in general, because they have very fast industrialization, and there is now some, the, the, the labor costs are growing because there is not enough labor force. So There's that's not enough thing. younger you people. Remember that fact, in fact, China is still uh, importing a lot of food. Most It's a lot of food that is being imported into China, so they're not able to support themselves. Yeah, and uh, it's also the fastest aging population, isn't it, uh, in yes. the world. Um, I, I had some, I, I wrote down a couple of numbers here. To sustain the birth rate uh, at the level it is in any country. To sustain the population at the level it is, you yeah, need a birth rate uh, of. Sorry, the, you need a birth rate of, that's right, uh, 2.1. Uh, uh, to children sustain per the female, population. Adult female. Uh, just 2.1 children. Per, per female. Yes, per mm -hmm. female. Per, per female. Um, the Chinese are at 1.16 now, which is the lowest ever for China and appears to possibly be the lowest we know about ever in history. 
Apart from the Black Death time or something Well, like any that. population that disappeared had clearly uh, an unsustainable birth rate. Yeah, so it's, like, it's like a Mayan situation, it mm -hmm. seems, at this point, where the society has o become over-sophisticated relative to its abilities to sustain itself through agriculture and, uh, uh, and, and other necessary industry. Yeah? So... Well, a lot of people... A lot of people that do, do the research, they insist that Chinese demographical collapse has not much to do with the, with the one-child policy, actually. So whatever, they are, they are trying to make changes now. They allow three children. But still, they're not getting the birth rate. It's because of the societal changes mm. and similar things. The urbanization. Societies. The urbanization is very important because they encourage, yes. at the same time, they encourage the one-child policy. That was Mao. Uh, so we're talking, what, it was it the 70s that Mao, right? Starting in the 60s. Did it start in the 60s? Yeah, and it lasted about 40 years. I because believe. that's the Cultural Revolution, too. Okay, so the one-child policy started in the late 60s, let's say, or sometime in no, the no, 60s. No, 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 it's 70s. It was the 70s. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, okay. So it's the 70s. And uh, that's why we have Old Geert here, to straighten us out. Um, and at the same time, they were encouraging people to move off the land where you're encouraged, where you naturally have more children, um, to the city where you naturally have fewer children, but in order to take industrial jobs, and uh, uh, in uh, mostly industrial jobs in the city, clerking jobs, etc. But I think, uh, and Olgerd, please uh, fill in the blanks or correct me where I'm wrong. But I think if we look at the history of the five-year plans in China, 1984 was uh, a big year because that was the first five-year plan that really began to push for any level of privatization of anything because they realized that there was an increased efficiency in farm output when the people doing the work had personal stake in the outcome. And in 1989, we saw Tiananmen Square protests because what the party gave, what additional privatization matters the party gave the people decided they wanted more, and they went out and protested, saying, this is not enough. We want even more privatization. And the party said, wait a minute now. You're going to go on our time scale. Olger, do I have that correct? And That's at a, the same time, yeah. there was one part of it that the Chinese government entirely stopped. There was this, this movement toward more freedom of thought and freedom of communication that stopped after Tiananmen. And it never came back in, in, in its uh, entirety. So even though China was pretty open, when I was studying there, it was nothing compared to what was before 89. Before 89, yeah. They started with the entrepreneurial uh, movement, as Philip has, has described. Can I, can I, I want to go over to another subject, though, yeah. because it's a very good, it would give us a very good window into the next problem. The next problem is rigidity at the top and inability uh, to uh, uh, stimulate their own innovation, hence they are massive importers of of uh, uh, agricultural products, as well as um, they tend to take other people's ideas and manufacture them rather than manufacture their own ideas and sell them to other people. I think if you look at the COVID situation in China, thinking, remembering that that's where it started as far as we know, we're not sure exactly how, there are several theories, as everyone knows. Um, we look at the COVID situation in China now, and it's a horror. Could you describe that a little bit for us? Because I, I, I believe you're following that, aren't you, Olgerd? Yes, I am following it. It's, uh, yeah. it's, uh, the COVID situation is really interesting because once, when you have a rigid structure like in China, you tend to overlook little things because you suppress them, just like was with COVID. And once you notice it, then you implement, and that's a big China problem. Once the central leadership recognizes even its mistakes, they tend to react not in uh, listening to what is happening and checking out, but in a general policy. So once they implemented the general lockdown policy, it stifled the Chinese economy for like two years and a half. And now something got through, some kind of information got through to the leadership or something changed with it, and they unlocked. And we all know what does it mean. And everybody confirms it's just a rampant virus in a population that was not well vaccinated and was not prepared for it. 
And now everybody gets sick, and this is another problem. And yeah, this kind of pandemonium. Although I would like to say that we really need to listen to people on the ground, that then, and that's one of the reasons Chinese governments is trying to get rid of foreigners all the time. There is a tendency to get rid of foreigners' residents, foreign residents in China, for a couple of years already, and it was really strong during the pandemia lockdown phase. And there is very few foreigners that are left. Not my, not, I mean, they are not kicked out of China yet, but they are forced by any most possible way. And we don't really know what is happening in many places. And you have to remember, China is a country of the size of a continent. So what is true for Beijing will not be true in Shanghai, and will be even less true in Guangzhou. And just to, to add a couple of statistics, uh, a couple of thoughts to what you were saying, one is that uh, there, were, uh, there were estimates that as many as 2 million people a day were uh, getting the infection. Now, as far as how many are dying, we really don't know, because they keep these secrets very close to their chest. I mean, we don't even know exact figures about who's dying in the war next door. So why would we know uh, anything about what's going on inside of China, except anecdotally or guesswork? Um, they themselves may not know. They themselves may not know. They, and, and they don't have... Uh, the other thing I want to say is, you know, we look at China and we looked at Russia, and you, all, you often build your enemy to be much uh, fiercer than they are. I mean, this is part of your self-defense mechanism, a sort of active paranoia that, that is uh, baked into our DNA that, that signals danger and helps us to prepare to, to combat it. But uh, we can see that uh, it's reasonable to assume that uh, both China and Russia has, have hu such huge internal problems that they're not really, the only threat they can pose to us is a nuclear threat. Oh boy. And that's the thing we have to worry about is a desperation that leads to that. Um, but as far as the, uh, the COVID thing, the other thing is, the, I, w I wanted to say, uh, although, I mean, both of you talking very well about, about these subjects, is that uh, the, uh, the Chinese vaccination never worked. It was, it's been insufficient to the job, and because of their xenophobia and the desire to say, hey, we know what we're doing. Remember the Kursk submarine that was under the water? Oh, we don't need your help. Yeah. Thank you very much. They lost everybody. Yeah. And now they're losing all these people for the same reason. And I suggest that these rigid governments are their own downfall. They are, because they, they don't yeah. have any external criticisms, internal criticisms, self-criticism. And that is an essential function to uh, course correct as we navigate forward. Yeah. And when we fail to course correct, when we fail to navigate, but rather sail blindly into the night, uh, we tend to hit the rocks and sink. A good point. How long do we give China, uh, Olgird, uh, before the cracks really start to show. I mean, even Germany is running out, out of adults to work. But in China, it definitely has the worst problem. Perhaps Russia is catching them because of the, all the war deaths and, and the people f uh, leaving the country because of the war, uh, uh, people of working age. Um, how long do you think China has before we start to see real cracks in the, uh, well, in the well, hull uh, of the ship of state? It's always very dangerous to to give predictions like that, I should not do it. But then I would say that you can have another way around. I don't, I don't think you you're, despite the beard, I don't see you as Nostradamus. I just would like an educated summation. Okay, <laughs> educated on guess, if you, can, if you can say so. Yes, sir, please. Uh, I would say that China is not going to fall apart. Eventually, they'll, they'll have a couple of factors playing in. One of the factors is the over population of uh, young males, societal problems and economic problems in the mainland and especially on the lower level of the society, which means they will have to have a war. And having a war would mean, you think, attacking Taiwan. As I insist, they have been proven really, it has been proven really well that Soviet-style fleet is not working well. So they will have to go somewhere on land. Would they choose India, which proven itself that it can fight and has uh, nuclear weapons, or another country that is starting really to fall apart, 
as opposed to modern China, which is still ruled pretty well ham-fisted by a pretty well ham-fisted party. North yeah. Which country is that? North, North Korea? Russia. Oh, no, Russia. Yeah, because it, Russia's government uh, it, it actually mirrors the Chinese government. It's just even less capable. Uh, it it's seems. much less capable. Therefore, yeah. they will have a weaker neighbor with a very interesting natural resources within. China is still pretty well managed. They have a functioning army, which is, has not been stolen like uh, Russian army. Yes. So I would say that's a danger. That's a very interesting possibility. Well, the, and that would strengthen China for a couple of years to come. But haven't, yes, because they, they need to import food. Of course, Russia doesn't have a lot of food, but they could get oil. Because what's close to China? What's the most invadable part? Where have they already made huge sneaking inroads into Russia? Siberia, right? But, okay, so how would this, what's the situation in that part of Russia now? And how do you think it might proceed? if your theory is correct. Okay, our, tell our me thought. how many people live in the far east of Russia and Siberia? Not many. And there's been a significant Chinese influx to the north for the past 20, 30 years. Right. So yeah. you've got 10, yes. 20 million Chinese in Siberia already. Right. Yes. And they slowly take over places like Vladivostok, which is a Chinese name of the place, is Haishan Wai. And, and they still use it when they talk about Vladivostok in Chinese. And they're slowly taking over. There is a couple of millions of Russians, a lot of minority nationalities, and even more. They have, Russians, they have a real demographic collapse. Like, seriously, serious problem. Because they are now sending all the people capable of, I'm sorry for that word, for breeding. Reproduction. To the death in Ukrainian fields. Yes. Yeah. And it, it seems like this is an interesting point. From the year ago when we started on this endeavor of analyzing this war and what it really means uh, historically and present uh, and the present and looking forward, um, we were very much focused on feeling out the relationship between China and Russia, the Russian strength, both with men, material, and morale. Uh, uh, we didn't know for sure. We were all looking at that. After coming up on uh, 11 months of conflict, we can now, uh, we're now starting to look at other factors. What is that relationship? The relationship between China and Russia is nowhere near as strong as one might have thought it was, uh, at least superficially at the beginning of the war. Even that superficial relationship is not strong. Putin is lying. To, uh, yeah. to uh, G, uh, oh, to no, the, no, 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 I don't believe face. in that. What? I no? don't believe in that. No? It seems to be like a very concentrated effort on Chinese side to convince the world that have been lied to. We got a minute and a half. Why don't you f finish it for us? And I would say, I would say that uh, she was pretty aware what was happening. Putin did not lie to him, but she wants to, to convince us that he's been lied to and eventually even use it as a pretext to punish Russia. Just as Chinese communists once after the great Vietnam-American War also tried to punish Vietnam. Very interesting. So we both see that China, the point is that China and Russia are much weaker than we had any, uh, at least the public, the zeitgeist, if I can if, use that word, was that they were, they were much stronger than we now see them. If as. we look at the population history of the Russian Far East, Sakhalin Island was Japan not so long ago populated yeah. with dissidents. They sent the dissidents out to the Far East to settle the area. Many of those people have since buggered off and they've moved yeah. to the U.S. or Canada or some other place. And yeah. so through death, emigration, uh, or simply inadequate population regeneration, the idea that Russia could expand and hold this area with its own native national population is, is over. And so I who's the winner so far in this conflict? China. Who's the winner, Olgierd, so far in this, in this conflict out of Russia and China and any other players in that part of the world? Uh, or, can you hear me? Because my, my camera just it, it froze, off, but we so can I'm hear you, and the program's ending. So go ahead and finish. I have no idea. 
You have no idea. A very honest answer. I'm going to go with uh, uh, the uh, United States. I think the, the United States is the winner. Russia is not going to regain California, as they insist in their press. <laughs> <laughs> or That's Alaska. true. I don't think Russia will get China. Russia will get California back. Uh, China may get part of Russia. Okay, uh, that's all we have for this particular show. I thought we just were getting our trousers off. We're just getting ready to go. We were. Yeah, but uh, in the third half, we'll finish there it up. We were just <laughs> ready to swim. You know, 400 meters. Okay, thank you everybody for watching. May I say you are looking well. Why don't you stay that way?